In the last video, I built this direct drive force feedback steering wheel. While it's a huge step up over my old Logitech wheel, I still had a few problems with it, so today I'm gonna fix it. I've also come up with another way to perform the same modification that doesn't require a beer motivated friend with a lathe. But before we get into that though, I've had a heap of comments asking about the maximum amount of torque this wheel can provide. I've read online that the larger stator version of these hoverboard motors can produce up to 15 Newton meters of torque, but I thought it's probably a good idea to test it myself to confirm if those claims are actually true. So here's what I'm gonna do. I've taken the printed table mounts off along with the quick release adapter and the shaft clamp. I've printed a simple shaft clamp that I can use to attach a lever to the motor, which we can then attach a weight to. I've also removed the cover of the motor and I've moved it out to my garage so I can clamp it directly to my heavy workbench to ensure it's as safe and secure as possible. Since a kilogram is almost perfectly 10 newtons, if we can support a one and a half kilo weight one meter out from the end of the shaft of the motor, that will mean we are producing 15 newton meters of force. The idea of a one meter lever sticking out from the motor doesn't sound like the safest thing ever. So instead I'm using a shorter offcut of 2020 extrusion I had and I've mounted it in the center so it's balanced. With it mounted in the center, we will have a 320 mil long lever. Since torque is simply force times distance, with a quick bit of maths, we can work out that the weight we need to support for 15 Newton meters at 320 mil is about 4.7 kilos. So I filled this five liter bottle with some water until it was the correct weight on the scales and then I hooked it onto the lever. I started out hanging the bottle close to the center of rotation and the motor handled it with no problems. I continued to move it out further on the arm until the motor could no longer hold the lever level. The farthest out I could go was about 280 mils, which means the motor is able to maintain almost 13 Newton meters of force. I don't have a good way to measure peak torque, but if it can maintain almost 13 Newton meters, it must be able to produce peak levels at least a little higher than that which I would say is a pretty great result and should put it right in the sweet spot for the amount of torque we need to get a good simulator experience. With that important question answered, now we can get back to solving all the problems I had in the last video, starting with the motor mod. In case you didn't see the first video, I had a lot of difficulty getting the modified motor bell to stay aligned and I ultimately ended up having to support it externally with bearings on eccentric shafts. I was pretty sure the cause was the thin front section of the motor bell being too weak to resist the pull of the magnets. The solution I came up with was pretty horrible, so I was determined to do something better. And that's when the idea hit me. We can just make a new top for the motor that mounts onto the back of the motor bell, which is already neatly machined and has mounting holes, and then just cut the old top of the motor off with a grinder or a hacksaw. No lathe needed. So I whipped up a quick design sent it off to PCBWay, and here's how it looks. This part was machined in 6061 aluminium and anodized black. I just love the open spoke look, and this should allow heaps of airflow through the motor to keep it nice and cool. The part fits beautifully into the back of the hoverboard motor bell. I did, however, find a small discrepancy with the bore size of the shaft hole, so I reached out to PCBWay to see what happened, and they've confirmed that maintaining a plus or minus 0.02 millimeter tolerance after anodizing isn't consistently achievable. So if you decide to get these parts made for yourself, I'd recommend selecting the raw machined finish to ensure the fit is accurate enough. And PCBWay are going to add a warning to the ordering page for me to ensure this is clearer for everyone in the future. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this project. Make sure you check them out at the link in the video description for all of your PCB, 3D printing, machining, and sheet metal fabrication needs. With the new motor front added, I clamped the stator in my vise and used its bearings so I could rotate the motor bell freely and cut the old front off. I used a grinder, but honestly, even a hacksaw would be fine. The cut on the back doesn't even need to be neat or flat, but I did give it a quick hit with a flappy disc in the grinder just to make it look good for the video. I gave mine a quick spray with some black paint so it would match the beautiful billet motor front and I put it all back together. The motor now spins freely and doesn't bind on the magnets at all. So I guess the front of the motor housing was the issue after all. So I put the motor back into the housing and started connecting everything back up. Unfortunately, the motor is a tad longer now. So I had to shift the motor controller around again to make it fit. I ended up printing a new mounting bracket that combines the controller and encoder mount into one piece. The new mount has M3 threaded inserts in the back. So I can easily attach the controller to the front of the mount. 
This new mount provides heaps more room inside the housing and even allows me to do a better job with routing the cables. With the controller and encoder back in place, all that was left to do is connect up the wires and put the housing back together. I did have to extend the power wires since the controller is up the top now, but it was worth it for how much neater it all is now. The next problem we need to look at is the table mounting bracket. For the previous video, I just had some 3D printed spaces to angle the wheel up a bit. They were never meant to be permanent, as I'm intending to mount this wheel to a simulator rig in the future, but they were bending so much that I had to do something about it in the meantime. So I laser cut a stronger bracket, cleaned it up with the grinder, and then finally bent it by hand in my vise. I did have to cut some pretty big relief slots to be able to fold the 3mm steel in my little vise, but this should still provide a much stronger mount than the printed parts I had previously. I finished it off with a lick of black paint and mounted it up to the bottom of the motor. Last but not least, the 3D printed quick release adapter I made for the first video lasted just long enough to get through filming, so I had PCBWay whip up a nice aluminium version of that at the same time, which should solve the last of our issues. Now all that's left to do is to give it another test. I've got my old Logitech wheel connected too so I can use its pedals. Let's give this a go. I'm really happy with all of that now. The motor is running much more quietly without the bearings running on the outside of the belt, and the improved table clamp and quick release adapter are working perfectly too. I know this is still a more complex way of building one of these wheels, but it was also partially an experiment for me to see what other ways I might be able to make use of these motors in the future, as I feel they have a lot of potential, especially with this modification. Let me know in the comments if you have any interesting ideas of how you could make use of these motors, or even just suggestions for future projects. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.